Welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's so great to see you here. I, I'm Catherine Bouguet, Head of Education at the Napa Valley Wine Academy, and we are thrilled to partner with Wines of Portugal to present Portugal, Old World with a New World Flair. A few housekeeping points for today. The webinar is being taped, and we will send you a link to the taped version as well as a PDF of the slides, so you don't need to madly write down lots of notes. Um, just give us a day or so to take care of that. The presentation itself is about 45 minutes, after which we'll open up the floor to um, questions. If you could go ahead and write your questions in the Q&A, please use the Q&A instead of the chat for your questions. Then we're going to go ahead and read the questions off of the Q&A. You can maximize the size of your screen, of the presentation screen itself, by clicking on the icon in the upper right-hand screen. It's on, in the active screen. Most importantly, have you poured your wines yet? Uh, if you have not, go ahead, please do. During the presentation, the wines will be tasted. I'd now like to introduce you to Eugenio Jardim, the very first Wines of Portugal U.S. Ambassador with a long career in wine. He studied under a renowned team of master sommeliers, including Evan Goldstein, at the Sterling School of Service and Hospitality. He has played an instrumental role in the San Francisco wine scene, creating prestigious wine programs at places like Jardinere and other, you know, top dining institutions. In 2010, Sunset Magazine named him Sommelier of the Year. Today, he also educates as acting director of wine studies at the San Francisco Cooking School, and he is an adjunct professor at the CIA Greystone here in the Napa Valley. If I mentioned all of his credentials, we'd never get to the presentation today. So without further ado, Eugenio, I, I leave this presentation in your good hands. Well, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. You're very, very kind for your very kind words. Welcome, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here on this beautiful day uh, to talk about Portugal. Um, I am so fortunate to work with such a talented group of people and even more fortunate to have some of them here with me today. Um, so I wanted just to let you know that uh, joining me here are Luis Cerdeira from Sualedo, um, who is a fantastic man. Hi, Luis, great to meet you. I know there's Antonio in front of it, but his, only his friends call him Antonio, so don't you dare to do that. Uh, the lovely Sandra Tavares. Sandra will be here representing the, or presenting the wines of her family, Quinta de Chocapalha, in the Lisboa region of Portugal. Um, Unfortunately, Maria Castro couldn't be here and I'll be presenting a wine in her behalf from the region of the Down. Uh, we have Rui Ribeiro. Rui is a winemaker by trade and he represents in the United States uh, the Simington family of wines, which is a, has a fantastic portfolio. Um, uh, we, we are having our, my colleague, uh, Sofia, uh, is stepping for, for Joana Massanita to, to present her wines from the Douro. Join us, but if, if she can't, Sofia is going to fill in brilliantly. I know that. And, uh, last but not least, we have Carlos Agrelos. And Carlo is from the gorgeous estate of, uh, Quinta da Romaneda in the Douro Valley. So this is the team that we have to present with me today, which I, I'm, I basically should just let them talk. But in the meantime, for those of you that have not had a, an opportunity to get to go to Portugal, I would like to invite you to Portugal now. So without further ado, we will start this presentation. And uh, it just takes a couple of minutes to load up and then I, we can start. Uh, in presenting to you what a beautiful country Portugal is. Um, there, the next few shots is meant are meant. To, the next few slides are meant to just make you feel like you really should be going to Portugal if you're not there already or haven't been, uh, because of the architectural beauty of the country, the, the the plethora of great varieties that you have a chance, the vineyard sites that are absolutely breathtaking, um, the culture, uh, the culinary, the history of Portugal. I mean, all of it make it for uh, a, 
a great argument for you to visit. I mean, do I need to say anything when I have photos like this uh, parading in front of you? So the diversity of the country of Portugal, geographically speaking, is breathtaking. And that allows for a variety of sensational wines to be created here. But what is most staggering is the fact that Portugal is a tiny country. Um, by American standards, Portugal is a quarter the size of California and is one eighth the size of Texas. Now, let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> you can fit Portugal eight times inside Texas. And within that small little area, um, Portugal has 250 varieties which are native, native of the region of Portugal, uh, of the Iberian Peninsula in general, Portugal, you can add to that even more grape varieties. Um, Winemaking here dates back to the Bronze Age, about 2000 years, and the entire length of the country and width of the country is covered in vineyards with 190,000 hectares of vineyards planted, which makes Portugal one of the percentage wise, one of the largest agricultural uh, er, that ed, agricultural uh, spaces dedicated to vineyards in the world. Um, Christian to the next slide, please. Um, and um, we, we have a good placement in the world in terms of business. Portugal uh, is the ninth uh, uh, exporter of wine, which makes it uh, to be quite significant in the sense that it's such a small place. Uh, it's the 11th producer. Uh, it has 2.6% of the global market and growing. Um, and also it's the number one in wine consumption in terms of the fact that uh, whenever the tourism has increased so much in Portugal, people have really discovered how wonderful this country is. And when they go there, they are amazed by how good the wines are. So the consumption went way up in Portugal. It's quite often either the first or the second in wine consumption per capita worldwide. Uh, on the next slide, I will show you um, the fact that what makes it so unique. Um, it is a, a, a blessing and a curse because when I'm presenting on Portugal, I'm gonna basically be telling you from the get-go, sorry, no Chardonnay, no Merlot today. Because why would I bother with international varieties in, in, in the setting when Portugal has 250 native varieties that are not even related to the, the international varieties that either migrated from the Middle East or from the Caucasus Mountain. Um, DNA studies have now proven that the varieties that we find in Portugal are related to the wild Iberian varieties as opposed to being uh, a, a, a parent, have a parenting that came from the Middle East. So on the next slide, I'll show you that this has been confirmed that the Iberian Peninsula, the reason for this concentration on native varieties is that Iberia was a sanctuary, it was a refuge for plants and animals and life in general during the last um, glacier, glacial uh, era, which was dates back to 20,000 years ago. Uh, Vitis silvestris, which is the species of varieties found a refuge in the warmer zones along the Mediterranean and the Southern Iberian Peninsula became a hub for, for life, for commerce, for wine during that period because the waters on the Mediterranean remained relatively um, uh, warm. So these varieties, this family of varieties developed in isolation. On the next slide, we will see that the concentration is proven here on this map that per thousand square kilometers in Europe, Portugal is ahead of everyone else in terms of concentration of the plantings of native varieties. Um, this is a map that makes me extremely happy. I like to show people how the Portuguese uh, wine sector is really dedicated to the preservation of these gems. On the next slide, you see why this happens uh, and why the, the diversity on Portuguese wine. Actually, the next few slides, I'm going to demonstrate this. This is the one that speaks of the, of the climate. Portugal has basically two neighbors. Spain, that goes all the way from Rios Baixas to, to the Mediterranean coast to the Algarve in the south and the Atlantic. 
the Atlantic covers the entire west and southern coast of Portugal, with being the southern being a little bit of a mix between Mediterranean waters and Atlantic waters. But what this map demonstrates is that the, the north and, and the east are blasted by the, the warmth and dry a dryness of the air that comes from Spain. That climatic influence from Spain is really what determined the structure of the wines, the weight of the wines. The Atlantic influenced wines uh, are blessed with the coolness from the Atlantic Ocean, the fog, the rain, but also with a lot of uh, salinity that travels in the air as well, informing the savory quality of those wines. On the next slide, you see that uh, is a clear, clear picture when you're close to the ocean, like Vinho Verde, Bairrada, Lisboa, Peninsula de Setúbal, the Açores or the Azores, and Madeira, uh, they are definitely influenced by this proximity to the water, and, uh, and, and, the, and the vineyards look lush and beautiful like such. In the next slide, it shows you what it is, what happens to the vineyard sites uh, when you are closer to Spain. Um, can you please change slides? Thank you. And this is the warmth of the interior, uh, the semi-arid conditions inside Spain. This is what influenced this zone. There's an incredible joke in Portugal that I, I, I try not to say, not to offend the Spaniards on, 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 on the call, but they say that there are only two things that come from Spain, bad winds and bad marriages. The, the bad winds is because it's quite warm, quite hot, and tends to cause havoc in the vineyards, sometimes destroy a lot of vineyards. I've been caught in one of those wind storms coming from Spain, and you see debris on the road. It's kind of crazy. But the bad marriage is because the king of Spain married the queen of Portugal and invaded Portugal. That was hundreds of years ago, but there is still a little bit of resentment there. But speaking of climatic conditions, this is what informs the, the characteristics of the wines of Trazos Montes, uh, Porto e Douro, Távora Varosa, Down, Beira Interior, Tejo, and Alentejo. On the next slide, you see the, the uniqueness that it is the Algarve region. I mean, it's, I don't understand how anybody can go to work when they live like um, just a couple of blocks away from beaches that look this spectacular. The southern coast of Portugal is very influenced by the warmer waters of the Mediterranean running into the Atlantic. And there's some really incredible vineyards, old vines in this region as well. On the next slide, we will see uh, the, the, how the soil really contributes to the variety of wines that can be made in the country. I love this map for so many reasons because it really proves a point how the soils are so important in viticulture. You see that where Luis is on the top of the country there, you, he's going to specifically talk about that zone later, and the down region and the Beta Interior and, and some sections of, of perhaps even the Douro and the Alentejo are covered in granitic soils. And then you have the Douro with the schist, the limestone in Baixá, the, the sandy soils in Tejo and, and limestone also in Lisbon, and the Alentejo that has everything. So this is a, a really good demonstration of how you can actually have whites and reds growing side by side in this kind of incredible quilt of soil types. Um, the wines in Portugal are basically classified in three very simple uh, uh, categories. Uh, vinho, which is our well-known table wines. We don't think about table wines very much. We don't talk about, we don't drink much very table wines because there are no stipulations for these, these wines as opposed to Vinho Regional, which is, our, is the IGP, or the DOC and DOPs, which are highly regulated. Um, there is minimum requirements for, for harvest, for grape varieties. There's grape varieties that are permitted or not. Uh, but in Portugal, there's an interesting thing. The IGP and the DOP, that is not a classification of quality. There's a lot of times that these are options that the winemaker has. Um, if any of them decide to do something outside of the rules or what's permitted in the region, they are immediately moved to the category of being regional, not as a punishment, but just as a clarification. Because on the next slide, you see who does that. And who does that is the CVR. 
the CVR is a commission, uh, Commission Vitivinicola Regional. See, even I that speak the language have trouble with that long word. But this is every region in Portugal, every DOC, every winemaking region have their own CVRs. And their CVRs are basically in charge. They are the guardians of the style of wines of each region. And they are the guardians of permit, uh, issuing permits uh, and also tasting the wines in the end. And give, this is a body of elected officials that serve the CVR, classifying and authenticating the wines. Their main job, their main um, a mission is to preserve the regional traditions and the culture of each region they represent. So what means reserva in one region cannot can mean something else in a different region. They are all independent regions in Portugal, but they are the ones in charge. Next, um, we will see the production of wine in Portugal and who has what. Um, obviously, the Douro has been, and it will continue to be perhaps for a, a few more years, the largest production region in Portugal with 23%, followed by the Alentejo, Lisbon. Um, and you see on the, on the right-hand side of, on that pie chart that about 49% of all the wines produced are indeed DOC wines in Portugal, with uh, with the IGP being 28% as well. So what makes me think when I look at this is that Portugal is really geared towards producing very high quality classified wine as opposed to the other way around. On the next slide, you will see um, my point of view, and I think this is, uh, has been determined, that the, the history of Portuguese wines will probably be said, we talked about before 1986 and after 1986, which is when Portugal joined the European Union. And uh, with the, to follow the European Union standards, a new deal system was uh, uh, written and designed, the regions were clarified and things were, were streamlined, but also there was a, a quite a bit of investment that came to the wine sector, which helped the wines and the wineries and the small producers immensely by giving them the means to acquire modern winemaking technology. And that provoked and promoted an attraction to a younger generation that saw this as a great opportunity to really come back to their families and enjoy their family business and produce wines in a much more modern, elegant uh, way. And Portugal is in the forefront of so many discussions, including global warming, with great varieties from Portugal now being permitted to be used in Bordeaux because of their ability to retain acidity, but also the winemakers. Everyone here in this call will tell you about this, that they are reworking their vineyards. They, they're, they're trying to understand better their terroir, the design of the vineyards, the clonal selections. Um, some wineries in Portugal have umpelographic vineyards just to test and see what grape varieties fare better under the new climate that we are all experiencing. Um, on the next slide, you will see that I'm not the only one that's a fan. Um, there's this lady here that probably commends a lot more respect, not probably, definitely commends a lot more respect than I do. Uh, Jensen says that for 13 years of tasting wines, the Portuguese wines came number one as an, as an average of wines that score about 16.5 and above on a scale of 20. Mitch Frank from Wine Spectator also thinks that 40 3% of the Portuguese wines scored 90 point plus. Uh, and then you all remember in 14 when it was so uh, unexpected and, and a wonderful gift to us that the Portuguese wines scored number one, three, and four on the top 100. That had never happened before. My next slide is, is a very interesting study that has been done. And this is the Geisenheim University that conducted about 1,500 interviews at Provine. In 2017, questions basically hovered around asking uh, buyers from 46 different countries, wholesalers, importers, restaurateurs, sommeliers, what is your area of interest? Where do you want to, where do you see your program moving towards? And um, Portugal came in in four, which I joke about with my colleagues that there's gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal, and losers. 
So I wasn't going to brag about being number four. But the next slide, and my co colleague Sophia cringes when I say that because she is very, she's the one that provided me with this incredible study that in 2018 and 2019, Portugal jumped to number one. So they increased the number of interviews. They remain with 46 different countries. But there is an incredible excitement towards Portugal as a new destination, as a place that people are really intrigued by and want to explore. On the next slide, you'll see that that is not just the specialists. The tourists are loving this. Um, 2017, 18, 19, and 20, Portugal is the leading destination. The region of Lisboa also got great scores and great press about being a fabulous place to visit and to taste wine. So in the next slide, I will give you what my reasons why I think this is happening to Portugal because Portuguese wines to me are a breath of fresh air. They are so unique, they are so different and you'll be able to taste them with the producers here. And what I think is that the relevance of these wines will reveal themselves on the ta at the table with food. This is following that European tradition that you don't just guzzle wine. You drink wine with food because that's when wine tastes better, that's when food tastes better. Um, but as a sommelier, which I was for 21 years of my life, um, I really realized how happy pe I made people when I served them a great Portuguese wine and they saw that the price was a fraction of what they expected. But the satisfaction was super high. So I, I say to those that think, oh, but it's so hard to have Portuguese wines. Nobody knows how to say alfrecheiro. And then up to those, I say, I didn't know how to say Zino Mavro either. I learned. I didn't know how to say Gadarka. Uh, so we learn. So my point is, forget what's on the label. Enjoy what's in the bottle. Because what's in the bottle, we are going to demonstrate to you that it's really worth the effort. The next slide is, takes us to the region of Vinho Verde. And this is the region where we have Luis Cerdeira here from Soledo. On the next slide, I'm going to show you a couple of things about this region, which is a very large winemaking region. It is heavily Atlantic influenced. There are no mountains in the coast of Portugal. The mountains are inland. So all those, those lines that you see on this map are the rivers. And the river valleys, the rivers always run east-west. So they provide they uh, opened the channels for the Atlantic influence to really inform this region. And you can see that with that, uh, besides having the, the granitic soils that I spoke of before, you see the heavy influence of the rains. It rains a lot here in the Minho. Um, Sandra, the, who is from the Douro, also uh, we know that we know that joke that uh, I think it was Rui Cunha that told me that it rains on uh, one day in Minho Verde as a rain one whole year in the Douro Valley and the upper Douro because it's a very very dry and here is very wet. Nine sub-regions, all dedicated to different grape varieties, which on the next slide you will see that um, it's not only a land of one grape. Can you move to the next slide, please? Um, there's not only one grape. There is the Loreiro, there is the Rarinto, there's Alvarinho that now is called the king uh, of the Vinho Verde. But there is also red wine and rosé wine made in the region. But on the next slide, what I want to pass the word to Luis. Uh, Luis is going to tell us about this fantastic Soalero Alvarinho that he produces in the region. Luis, please, you have. Uh, Janio, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. It's very, it's very nice. And um, uh, Soler Granite is like um, a, a new discover on Monsai Melgaço, that it's the region that uh, linked to the origin of Alvarinho in Portugal. And in fact, uh, we have um, uh, a mountain that protects Monsai Melgaço. And this mountain um, makes that we have a, a, a climate a little different from the other subregions, a little more inland. And this makes that our uh, grapes, our Varinho grapes, because of the very warm days and cold nights, we have uh, uh, alcohol a little higher than usual in Vinhos Verdes. And we have also 
uh, freshness because the cold nights help that freshness don't go out. Something we are very focused nowadays is about uh, sustainability and climate change. And in fact, this is a reality. I'm sorry to be so precise, but it's a reality. And we, uh, in the time of my father, we don't have vineyards in the altitude that now we have granite above 300 meters. In the past, like when Soler began uh, in 1982, the vineyard's maximum altitude is until 200 meters. And nowadays, we discover, because the, the region is growing altitude organically because of, of this ch climate change, of this warming, slow warming, and uh, nowadays we discover that we have a very good freshness, very good saltiness on the mountains. The big difference, uh, I don't know, Eugenie, if you want to, that I go a little more on detail or if you want to put um, me some questions. Well, I think this is fantastic. Uh, I, I think I, we, we can save a little bit for the, for the end because I okay. know many people will be wanting to ask you questions. And one thing that I wanted to bring up is that I learned this recently, that Soalheiro means a, a sunny place. So uh, contrary to the, the Al albarinos uh, grown in Spain, which are very coastal vineyards, this jumped the Mino River, but went inland, producing this wine with so much more texture. Luis, I love the wine. Thank you for your presentation. And we're going to move on to the next and come back to you on the Q&A time. Thank you for Thank you, Eugenia. with this delicious wine. And this is a Vino Verde DLC. So um, now you're moving to wine number two, which comes from the beautiful region of Lisbon. Um, Lisbon has two of the most unique Portuguese varieties. One is the red ramisco, it went on the lower corner of your screen that is grown on, grown on sand dunes near Lisbon, and also the arinto. Arinto is a grape in Portugal that has been discovered as the magic solution because it retains acidity under all types of climates, all types of soils, the wine remains extremely fresh. So it is really important uh, for producers. And moving to the next slide, you see that in the region of Lisbon, um, it, it, it's like Vinho Verde, heavily influenced by the Atlantic. Um, the coolness comes in quite significantly. Lisbon, the city of Lisbon, for those of you that haven't been, is situated right below the number 09 on the map. Between 09 and 08 is where Lisbon is located. And this wine uh, that our lovely Sandra Tavares is going to introduce is from the region called, sub-region called Alenquer which is number five on the map. This region, like many others in the, in, the, in the area of Lisbon, is marked by small little inland valleys that really funnel in the air from the Atlantic and benefit from it. So on the next slide, you will see that there's not only uh, white grapes in the region, that the region is also very known for red grapes, especially the red grape called Castellão, um, but also with some Aragonese, which is Tempranillo, uh, Turiga Nacional, Fernão Pires, and many other. But on the next slide is what matters the most. It is, and I want to introduce Sandra Tavares da Silva. Uh, Sandra has projects in the Douro Valley and also in Lisbon, wow. where she is the winemaker for her family estate called Quinta de Sotapalha. Sandra. <laughs> Hello. It's great to be here and thank you, Eugenio, for the great presentation and, and, and Napa Valley Wine Academy to, to bring all together on this, on this uh, webinar. So I'm a winemaker from Quinta Chocapaila. Chocapaila is the property from my parents that decided to change their lifestyle and, uh, and decided to move to a property. We used to, move, to live in Lisbon on the city and they decided to create roots in the property. So uh, my father was a Navy officer and he was always traveling all around the world and, and uh, especially because he worked a lot with NATO. And my mother, she's Swiss and she was long times alone with me, and my sisters. So we decided, they decided to buy a property and create a project that we, we, we really will in, in, uh, uh, create these roots and, and make a wine together. So the property is located in Alain Care, as Eugenio was say, mentioning, which is a lovely uh, DOC 
because it's uh, we are a bit we are close to the coast. We are about thirty kilometers from the coast, but still we are protected with the small mountains that surrounds from the west and also from the north. We have Monte Junto uh, a mountain, so really creates a. Uh, uh, like a nest with that we have all this uh, humidity coming from the ocean, but during the day it's warm. So during the, the morning it's always very moisty and and, uh, and and foggy, and then during the day it's very sunny and bright. And this really permits to have a fantastic microclimate to produce amazing reds, but also for the whites, and especially at into it, it's a my favorite white variety, and especially because it's indigenous from Lisbon. Uh, it's one of the oldest white varieties we have in Portugal. And I love this purity and, and this, it's a very focused variety with a amazing acidity, but with great structure and texture. So this is a fermented in tanks, so no addition of oak at all. So it's a very bright and fresh and pure Add into that, it's fantastic to pair with so many dishes, and especially oysters, seafood, or whatever. It's a great, great way of white wine to, to well, share. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. And it is, it is for those of you that have not uh, maybe see this as an expected surprise. The salinity on the wine is really mm -hmm. brilliant, uh, and it makes it for a great food wine. And uh, thank you, Sandra. And I'm sure we'll thank have plenty more questions for you on the Q and A session. The next one um, that we are presenting comes from the region of Down and La Foinge. Uh, this is a region right in the center of Portugal, and you can move to the next slide and see the details about it. What is really interesting about this region, which I'm going to present the wines to you, is that it is surrounded by mountain chains. Uh, this is right beneath the city of Oporto, so it's in the north center of Portugal. But it has this continental climate without any excesses from continent or from the Atlantic. It, it, these mountains protect this region and promotes this really incredible oasis where two very large rivers run through uh, and the region flourishes with agriculture. It is a beautiful, quaint uh, little area in Portugal, um, it, but also it's marked by altitude. So now we are, we're moving into a, a, a region, a central region that is actually um, making the best out of all these mountains that surround it because, and also benefiting from the granitic band of soils that come down from Vinho Verde and smacked right in the middle. There's a, a granitic massive in the middle uh, of this region that really informs the wine. And altitude, this is all about altitude. These are wines that are, are really, really informed by the, 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 the climate and the environment where they're grown. On the next slide, you see that there is something very interesting about this region is that um, they claim that this is the home of Turiga Nacional that there's a small little village called Turigo, and that it's too much of a coincidence that there will be a, a village named Turigo, a great name Turiga, and that wouldn't be from here. Some of the winemakers in the Douro Valley may have like, yeah, I don't know, I think it's ours. But it is a good little tit for tat in the sense that everyone loves the Turiga Nacional and want to have that grape as part of their of their something they can claim. Um, the, the, the average wines here are usually a blend, a blend of uh, Turiga Nacional, Alfrucheiro, uh, Tinta Rorish. You see here the new name for Aragonés, which is Tempranillo, um, and, and also uh, uh, the Jaén, which is the, the local name for Mencia. On the next uh, slide, you will see that this is a wine made for a man that needs no introduction. This is a project of Alvaro de Castro with his daughter, who unfortunately tried and tried and tried, but couldn't be here with us tonight. And it is a wine that has all the best of the grapes of the region. It is a state that dates from a very, very long time ago. This is their family winery, and they are dedicated with this uh, on the sandy soils um, of the region, but also 
what is really, really important here is to notice the freshness of a combination of granitic soils and altitude of the vineyards. Um, this wine to me, it is like one of those, I almost interpret like the same way that I do a Cru Beaujolais. I like it with a slight chill because it really lifts, lifts the, the aromatic profile of this wine, which I find quite perfumey. And when, and when you have Turiga Nacional that has such little intervention with it, what you really benefit from is that you capture the aromas. Turiga Nacional is known to be a very floral grape variety. And because here we have 60% of it, you get that violet hints and notes to it. This is a very old, old estate that the family took over again in 1980 to bring it back to life. And uh, 12 months in Allier barrels and fermented in stainless steel. Have a sip and you will know what I'm talking about. I often talk to Sandra about this that every time I go to Portugal, I keep hearing the word, the word freshness and frescura. And this wine to me typifies the wines that carry, carry some weight. It has texture in body, but it's really bright and fresh. On the next slide, uh, I hope you're all enjoying this. Now we're moving to the Douro and Porto region, which is the quintessential views of Portugal, one of the most beautiful wine regions in the world. You can see on the next slide that uh, I'm not the only one that thinks that. UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site in 2001, but it's also the oldest demarcated and regulated region in the world. It dates back to 1756. So this is a, an area that is protected by mountains in the north and in the west. So there is no Atlantic influence really coming through the region. There's three sections that you need to know of, three sub areas, uh, Baixo Corgo, Cima Corgo and Douro Superior. The Douro Superior basically abuds against the Spain and the Baixo Corgo abuds against the Marão Mountains, which stops a lot of the rain coming from Vinho Verde, a lot of the moisture. So mostly when you see this, you think of two things. You think the, the port wines, the schist soils, and indigenous varieties. There are over 60 indigenous varieties. But what is really funny also is that the temperatures. It is in, uncanny to me how this region can produce wines of such finesse and elegance, having gone over 100 degrees of temperature in the summertime and below freezing in the winter. So the, the, the durians, uh, the locals say that they have two seasons in the Douro, um, three months, uh, nine months of winter and three months of hell, because when it's hot, it's hot. And if you have my haircut, please bring a hat or you are really in big trouble. The next slide will show you in, in very clear, uh, this is not a unique shot. You know, like when you have a place that has one good side, like a picture, this is any turn of the road in the, ro in the Dodo Valley, you will see something as spectacular as this photo. On the next shot, I'm gonna tell you that these three regions are basically climatically classified. The soils are pretty much uh, even throughout the regions, uh, being that the most historic vineyards are on the red part of this map, the Cima Corgo, which uh, historically has been making port wines. The Douro Superior is the easternmost, the driest, the least amount of rain. And you can see here on the bottom picture what a vine has to go through to get to moisture and to nutrients on the subsoil. Um, the soils are all fractured, uh, schist, um, that looks like uh, uh, old and aged and rusty slate soils. The vineyards on the next uh, slide, you will see a picture of them. There are three types of vineyards plantings here. On the far left corner of your map, you see a very barren looking vineyard. Those are called sucalcos. They are the old vines. Old vineyards in Portuguese means they are mixed plantings. These are like one tiny little row of vines per terrace. 
These are the oldest. Right below that, you see some, some walls, some retaining walls built. Those are called patamaris. Patamaris were built with the intention of, of maximizing production. So you can run little tractors between the four to six rows that they have. And then on the other side of the vineyard, all the way to the top of the picture, you will see the Vinhas Alto, which to me is just a crazy project of people that plant vineyards going straight down the hill. And if you would be on top of that hill, you would say, I will not harvest this vineyard unless I have a harness and I'm attached to a truck, because it would be very easy to roll down the hill to your peril. So this is what they do to make wine. If it, this is not a labor of love region, I don't know which region it is. On the next map or on the next uh, slide, you will see where it's located in Portugal. Um, the down right below, the Vinho Verde right to the west of that. And we all know, uh, probably you do too, that uh, there's five top grape varieties planted here, red varieties, which are Turiga Nacional, Turiga Franca, Tinta Roriz, Tinta Barroca, and Tinto Caon, which makes the, the majority of the grapes that go into the port production. But also there are some winemakers here in the skull that makes exceptional white wines from Viozinho, Codega do Larinho, Malvesia, Fina, and Rabigato. Do not forget this, make a note to self, try some Doro Whites because they're also ex excellent. On the next slide, um, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Rui Ribeiro. Rui is a winemaker uh, by trade and also he's in charge of the US market for the Seamington family of wines. Rui, welcome and tell us about this delicious red wine that we're tasting. Hi everyone, thanks Eugenio for the great presentation of the Douro. Uh, I think uh, it's like you, you, you have done such a great job explaining the region, so you, you have just made my life way easier. So speaking about Postscriptum, and I'll focus on the project. Uh, this is a project, a partnership between two families, Simington family and Prats family. So Bruno Prats uh, is the former owner and winemaker for Chateau Cos de Cernel. And he came to the Douro in 1999 looking for a partner to produce a world-class wine based on Portuguese varieties from the Douro Valley. So uh, he thought that the Simington family, given their experience uh, with the different terroirs, might be helpful and might be the right partner to, to get to that objective of producing a world-class wine. And that world-class wine, the name is the, the Crisea. If you see the label of Postscriptum, it says postscriptum of Crisea. So the, the initial part of the project was to produce just the Crisea, uh, which was one that we started in 2000. Uh, and uh, Crisea has been showing its characteristics and its pedigree along the last 20 years, uh, some years with fantastic distinction. But basically, the initial objective uh, has been accomplished year after year, which is produce a world-class wine based on Portuguese varieties. Uh, so at the beginning, what Bruno did differently was to bring some of his Bordelais expertise and uh, kind of winemaking criteria uh, in order to promote the freshness, to promote uh, words that, as, as, um, as Eugenio explained, nowadays we use the word freshness very often, but with our traditions of producing uh, extracted wines from the Douro, particularly with our culture of port wine, back in the day was not so common to have uh, such a high level of freshness and uh, and fresh fruit was more on the on the ripened side of things. So Bruno brought that mentality, aiming for more finesse, uh, reducing the extraction, promoting the integrity of the tannins, promoting the integrity of the phenols and the, the skins, uh, and that had an effect initially there was a reaction like these wines might be too light uh, to be from the Douro. Fortunately, along the years, this technique and this approach has, has proven uh, right in a sense that it delivers a different perspective, a different interpretation uh, without losing any of its Douro characteristics. So right now we have uh, in the market the Crisea and the Postscriptum 2018. So the postscriptum is what we very often call the a declassified Crisea, in the sense that it's made uh, from the same vineyards with the same grapes. It's the second selection. So basically, the first selection of 
grapes and wines, uh, we, we ferment all the, the wines in the same way. By the end of the harvest, we start selection. And uh, the first lots that we make are the Crisea ones. And the, the second selection is going to be uh, postscript them. So something that is common uh, between the, the two wines is the wood that we use. I mean, the, the oak, it's all about 400 liter barrels, which are uh, slightly bigger than the classics 225s. And this was one of the, the Bruno Pratt signatures uh, in a very French manner. He said, and he keeps saying that, we wanted the oak to be part of the frame, not to be part of the picture. And this is something that at the beginning made us uh, smile, but it makes perfect sense. And it's an analogy that you really can see when you taste postscriptum. So postscriptum, it's usually like Prisea, a break between mostly Toriga Nacional and Toriga Franca. The, this example of 2018 has slightly more Toriga Nacional. Uh, very often Toriga Franca is the one that dominates. So it goes, depending on the year, 60, 40, 50, 50, 70, 30, depending on the year. And Eugenio mentioned the, the, that uh, people from the Douro might be uh, not so happy with, with Toriga Nacional being from down. I think we, we, we all live well with that. Uh, <laughs> but if you say something about Franca, probably is when you get as mad, because Franca, it's clearly one of the varieties that uh, hasn't reached the top in terms of world recognition. Uh, but we do believe, or I believe most of us it believe- will that Turiga Franca will reach the top. The noblest of the tannins of Turiga Franca, it's something that you really can see in a wine like this. So typically, Crisea and Postscriptum, both wines are marked by an expression of fruit that is, it's not very obvious, it's kind of a shy fruit, uh, it's profound, but uh, towards the, the, the darker fruits, uh, some uh, notes that are very hard to describe at the first sight, and once you swill the, the wine in the glass, it starts developing. And a point that is a signature of the house and you can find between the two wines is the dough glass of the tannins. I mean, the yeah. structure is there, the power is there, but you don't find any dryness from the attack towards right. the end. So I agree. Is, and Hui, I often yeah. say that uh, um, the, the post-scriptum is the one that I buy and drink, and the, the Crisea is the one that I buy it and use in my cellar. I'm sure everyone will have a lot more questions for you in the Q&A. Thank you for presenting this wine to us. It is delicious. It never, it never fails to impress me year in, year out. Thank Hope you. Hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Our winemaker is actually uh, Joana. And uh, Joana, I, I can see here that she is struggling with trying to get a good connection. Um, if she is in here, uh, uh, she can jump in. But if, if Joana, if you have any problems uh, getting connected with us, uh, Sofia is prepared to present the wines for you. She is the sister of Antonio Massenita, and together they are the duo brother and sister winemakers in the uh, Alentejo, in the Azores and in the Dodo region, and God knows what else these two are up to. And uh, um, Joana, if you have a good connection, please introduce us your wine. Yeah, actually, well, I guess. You know, obviously, Joana is having a, a bit of a trouble to get in. So, Sofia Salvador, which is our chief educator for Wines of Portugal, my dear colleague from Lisbon, is going to talk about this project. Hi. So, uh, I've been uh, I've been exchanging messages with uh, with Joana. Uh, she's in the middle of the Indic Ocean, so <laughs> complicated. Um, I'm here to explain their project. So Antonio and, and Joana are sister and brother, and the project is called Masanita Wines, and it's actually called uh, Siblings and Winemakers. They're both winemakers, and they've been uh, uh, been also business partners uh, partners for ten years. Um, Antonio is already quite well known for his projects in Alentejo and the Azores, like uh, Eugenio has said, uh, and Joana is also uh, doing consultancy for many wineries in the Algarve region. 
Eastern in the southern parts of Portugal. Uh, and they decided to get together finally to do their own project together in the Douro, where they are making wines of the three uh, sub-regions of the Douro, uh, being this one specifically from the Simacorgo area of the Douro. Uh, Joan also asked me to tell you for fun that uh, yes this is a sibling project they have a lot of discussions about the wines and decisions they have a lot of fun too and she says that Antonio is all nonsense and she's the one that fixes the problems and make all the wines being top wines so that's how their dynamic goes <laughs> exactly so this this wine is a, a blend from the Douro as I said it's from Sima Corgo in the middle part of the of the Douro region uh, it's 55% of Toriga Nacional coming um, these are vineyards with more than 25 uh, years uh, then there is 25% of old vineyards which are more than 80 years old and then there's 20% of Sozão uh, younger vineyards of 10 years old uh, this is a wine with minimal intervention, manual harvest, um, grape selection at the end of the winery, cold soak and then controlled temperature fermentation. Then there's also some post fermentation uh, that lasts for around uh, 10 to 30 days. Then part of the wine is aged uh, in stainless steel, 50%, but then 25% in neutral, in neutral barrels. Um, here um, the alcohol is 13.5% and then I'm going to pass it on to Eugenie which has probably tasted the wine now and I have not the wine we drink yes. so I wish I absolutely. could talk more about that. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and one interesting thing here, Sophia, that we can share with everybody is when you see in the Portuguese wine label old vineyards, which Sandra can Sandra can tell you a lot about old vineyards because she made a mission on, on purchasing old vineyards. Yeah. Um, old vineyards doesn't refer necessarily just to the age. It's not only the age of the vineyard. In America, we have this dilemma. What's an old, old vineyard? 20, 30, 80, 100, 120? They all call themselves old vineyards. So, but here is that style, the style that is pictured on the picture on the left the single rows of vines that are mixed planting. I remember walking a vineyard and, and uh, um, the Masanitas probably have done that in selecting their sites, is that you walk through a vineyard and you go, that's Turiga Franca, that's Turiga Nacional, that is Sozão, that is Rabigato, which is white. That, I don't know what it is. That is, it is a fascinating uh, archive of the history of winemaking in Portugal, reason why the wines are mostly blends. On the next slide, I'm going to invite uh, Carlos Agrelos from Romaneira. Uh, Quinta da Romaneira is a, a spectacular estate in, in the Douro. And uh, they have some of the, I think, the longest uh, river exposure of any estate, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. It is a breath taking breathtaking estate like all the others <laughs> uh, there is no ugly places in the Douro that's a joke that I always tell people you throw a stone you hit something beautiful um, Carlos please tell us about the 15 Quinta da Romaneda hello everyone uh, thank you Eugene for for your presentation uh, on, on the region and, and Portugal in general well in fact you are correct uh, Quinta da Romaneda I think I'm not sure if it's the largest one, but it, 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 it certainly, in, in terms of, of river line or coastline, uh, we're just under three kilometers. And that equates to a property of 1,100 acres, which is uh, rather big in the Douro. Um, and, and this is one of the, uh, like many others in the Douro, in fact, because we are a historic wine region, uh, we date back to 1757, so we're just coming up to 265 years of existence, which uh, is fantastic. Um, we are located on the right bank of the River Douro, uh, in the center of the Douro region, in the Simacorgo area. And uh, we have currently 85 hectares or 210 acres of vineyard in the middle of a very lush Mediterranean uh, forest all around. 
So we are, are very fortunate to have this absolutely stunning terroir where we are surrounded by all this biodiversity and the air is constantly perfumed. And I think that absolutely influences the style of our wines. Uh, me, Carlos, uh, I'm a fifth generation uh, from a wine family in the Douro, and I joined Romaneira as a technical director in January of 2017. And I'm very fortunate and very happy to, to be here because of all the diversity that I find and the, able, the wines that we're able to make. Uh, this wine that we bring to you, which is the uh, Rumaneira, Quinta, simply Quinta de Rumaneira, the name of the state, red 2015, um, we bring to you because it was the first uh, red wine we made out of this property, out of this current ownership in 2004. So we have produced this wine for 11 years on the trot. And this is a blend that um, really shows you what the Doro or mix of the top three pro uh, grape varieties can bring to you. This is a wine made from Toriga Nacional, uh, Tinta Roriz, uh, Toriga Francesa and Tinto Cão. And unlike other wines that we make that are very fruity, floral, extremely intense and also port wines, this wine is more on the earthy, spicy, uh, slightly jammy fruit style, which, is, which I find is great. And all backed by some serious uh, uh, tannins that are very smooth now. That's why we present the 2015. Uh, personally, I like to drink Dodo wines that uh, uh, have some age on them. So three to f three absolutely minimum, uh, five years is great. So I think this wine now is drinking very well. And I think you'll be surprised by the retail price you'll find in the US. Not that I'm very happy for that because uh, we'd like to sell <laughs> the, the wines uh, much uh, uh, at a higher price, but, but that's what it is. And I think you can find this wine ranging from $27, I think, up to the maximum of, of $35 which I think is, 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 a really, is an excellent it's, bargain. It's fantastic quality. The price quality ratio is unbeatable. And also, uh, um, um, Christian, we can even stop the slides here on this high note and, and go into the Q&A uh, section of the program. But Carlos is being very, very humble about this because um, he joined this, he did not make this wine, he put it together, but I've been to the vineyard and to the winery recently and tasted the new releases and they are even better. So Carlos, bravo. And now I believe uh, we should just open up to questions. Um, as Christian has suggested, please enter your questions here on the Q and A. Um, and and um, somebody, uh, Kara said that these are stunning. Uh, and Julian Balance, uh, a master sommelier is here with us, joining us. Thank you, Julian, for being here. Um, appreciate you, your comment. Um, Julian has been to Portugal and is also a fan of Portuguese wines. So please feel free to use the Q&A section here, the button to ask any questions to the producers. Um, I can throw one question out there and because uh, and that is specifically for the Doro producers that are here. Maybe we start with Sandra um, and then go to Carlos to hear their opinion. It's like, I've been hearing a lot of transitional soil plantings in the Doro, meaning that people are looking for vineyards that have a transitional from schist to granite. Um, are you working with that? And what does that bring to the wine? Um. Uh, go ahead, Sandra. No, go ahead. Uh, so I, I really love the, the areas of transition of soils, but especially for the white wines. So we, for our white wine guru, we use uh, very uh, vineyards, very old vineyards, but on higher altitudes, about 600 meters altitude. And it's really the area of transition of soils. Uh, so, and this really makes wines with uh, amazing uh, complexity with, with the texture of the schist. 
uh, but also the minerality and purity from the, 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 the granite. So I think it's, it's amazing areas and, and amazing terroir for producing great wines. Yes, well, we're, we're not actively looking for that, but, but uh, at Quinta da Romaneira and Quinta do Noval, where I'm also responsible for the winemaking, um, on the, the highest uh, plateaus, we have some granite. And as Sandra mentioned, um, that's where we plant the white wines. So, white, uh, the white vines, sorry. And, and so, um, we tend to get all the acidity at, more out of the granitic soils than the schistous soils. And we can make uh, very precise, uh, aromatically precise and um, acidic, with the optimum acidity, wines in granitic, in granite soils. So that, I think that would be the difference between schist and, and granite. Although you can have fantastic white wines in schist also. But Correct. in our estate, it's the very top at 500 meters that we have some granite in the schistous soils. Terrific. Um, somebody had a question about food and wine pairings. And, and because I presented a Quinta de Sage, I really, I really talk about Quinta de Sage in the context of the middle range of foods, for example, roasted chicken, uh, duck, um, um, game meat in general, I think is what go best with Quinta de Sage. Now, um, I'm going to pass this question, this next question. Um, does the, do the Vinho Verde Alvarinho spend any time on the lees? And is that common? Luis, that is a question for you. I can't answer that. <laughs> yes, this is, this is common. Uh, and um, nowadays we we really uh, know that we can close a little more the the nose of the wines and give a little more amplitude in the mouth when we we have this um, this contact with lees. Uh, in fact, nowadays so, uh, our objective is to produce more and more precise of our English. and I think this is a huge difference uh, on style from Portugal and Spain. No judgment about quality, judgment about style. And our, our wines, uh, because we are inland and now we go with granite with altitude, the, the roots go more on the minerals on the soil, not on the fertile soil, like you have, for example, near the Atlantic, like in Spain, in Galicia. And these roots, when they go more to the minerals, you have a saltiness sensation in Navarino, that it's something new uh, that we discover, and it's very gastronomic, as you you say. Uh, and nowadays, uh, we are very precise in Portugal. We are a Mediterranean country, and we love food with wine. Okay, and um, the new tendencies of more lighter food globally is very adapted to to our gastronomy. Um, a simple ceviche that now maybe can make a substitution of sushi and sashimi. <laughs> Indeed. Um, this is very good, yeah. Yes. Uh, Hui, I will have a question for you because uh, Michelle has asked, for a asked a very interesting question about uh, um, biodynamic and organic methods of agriculture. And I know you are with the Simington Family Wines, which is the largest land owner in the region. Can you tell us about biodynamic farming, organic farming? Are you guys doing? Are you guys not doing? And are the other winemakers, feel free to jump in if you have something that is really relevant about that type of agriculture. So within the project that we were talking today, the Prats and Simington project, we don't have a specific uh, organic or biodynamic uh, procedure. What we have is what we call a minimum interventional agriculture, uh, which uh, it's a set of measures that our viticulture team believes that are the best to suit our needs, not just in terms of uh, of the quality of the wines, but also uh, to accomplish some internal uh, requirements that we have since we are certified via Corp and there is an agronomic aspect of that certification. But we have other projects, of course, uh, particularly one in the Douro Superior, where we, we, we grow fully organic, uh, certified by Sativa, and uh, with, uh, with great uh, feedback in the US and more and more uh, 
people like myself within the company that travel very often, we see the demand and we see particularly in the, the, the on-premise scene in the US, it's a very interesting talk point, talking point. It's uh, more and more producers are adopting uh, organic methodology. And uh, this is something that, uh, as I said, we have that large property in the Doro Superior, the name is Quinta do Teiz. And uh, that is, is the area where we have been exploring the most. We have a couple more uh, properties or, or blocks uh, in the, the Rio Torto area, uh, but uh, not with the dimension that we have that, that one in the, in the Doro Superior. And it probably no. makes sense. It probably makes sorry for interrupting. But it probably makes sense because it is the driest region, so the the, the disease attack may be a little bit a little milder there. Um, I want to like loop in Sandra in this because I have a question regarding uh, that type of agriculture and uh, dealing specifically with the ancient old vineyards that you have uh, recovered. Is it easy? is easier to treat an old vineyard uh, in organically and biodynamically, or do you need more help from um, other things, uh, modern uh, techniques to take care of the vineyard? Yeah, I think uh, it's the only issue with, uh, and I think the difficulty working in majority of our vineyards are very old. So we have been investing and buying very old vineyards here in Balmendi's area and Pinha Valley. So the biggest issue is the labor, I think, because uh, we have a fantastic weather and fantastic climate. So we, are, we, are, we don't have so much pressure in terms of diseases as other wine regions. And, and we work a lot as well with biodiversity. So uh, all our vineyards are surrounded by forests or wild bushes or so I think in this sense it makes easier to to control some of diseases because uh, some of these plagues are, are are eaten by birds or or other or other insects so we it's not so so difficult or hard to work organically as as we we work uh, and even we don't have to do so much treatment so because we have to do everything by hand. We can't, majority of our vineyards, we can't put a tractor in. So, but I think it's, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. but I think it's fantastic to, to recover and to treat these vineyards and keep them very, very healthy. Um, for those of you, for those, for the 45 people that are still here watching us, these three winemakers are so humble as far as how hard their work is because their vineyards are like this and you trip and you die, and they're gonna catch you a month later when they get down to the bottom of the hill. So this is a, a really labor of love. Luis, uh, you are in the Monsão e Melgaço region. My God, it's like the, the holy grail for Alvarinho in Portugal. Um, what is, what is the, the tendency in, in the, the, the region? How, is, does everyone think the same way towards converting to a, a certain level of agriculture, certain style? Or you are on your own. You you, you put you put a very good question about this because we have 14 hectares in in organic, and we move this year to biodynamic certification, and we don't we have this since 2007 and we never put uh, in the market. We begin this year because we believe that this concept will grow organically uh, in sustainability for other places. I can tell you one project, and I think this is global in Portugal. The care about uh, the care about environment, it's biodiversity, is something that it's growing a lot. And uh, we we imp we have a club of uh, 150 producers that are linked with Soalheiro, and these producers we implement a standard of uh, um, sustainability in the vineyards that we are in the end really. It's, it's uh, usually people talk about regions, uh, implementing this in region, and we implement this with, in our club, really a certification, really a certification. And it's something that we will get this in one month. And we are very proud because the people are proud to have this, you understand? And this global, this global um, uh, new way of thinking uh, will came to stay. It's not something that we, we are moving out. 
And uh, when you when uh, Rui talk about B Corp, B Corp it's something that we make evaluation also. It's very very focused on social, on uh, environment, on biodiversity. And um, I, I think the last thing uh, we implement in the winery is fantastic for this. We we achieved the certification on in, in ID and innovation. I don't know in English very well. Investigation, I think, is development and innovation. And this organizes all our ideas. For example, we use mycorrhizas, mycorrhizas, I don't know, in the vineyard, all the vineyards, to, to be more sustainable. And um, this helps us on knowledge. Knowledge is the most important thing. And I think Portugal have a lot of knowledge in wines and vines. Mm -hmm. I, I am very sad that uh, I'm very sad, but I'm very mad. Joana, you're in the in the Maldives, which is a dream of mine to ever go to the Maldives. So I'm not sorry that you're in the middle of a storm. However, I would love for her to give her uh, uh, her uh, two cents on on this conversation as well. Um, um, uh, Sofia Salvador is here also from Portugal. She has a, a wealth of knowledge about the Portuguese wines. And uh, one of the things, Sofia, that I have noticed in Portugal recently is winemakers really, really talking about um, trying different things. And you, um, there was an excellent article written about Portugal being on the forefront of climate change. What are you hearing from the winemakers in Portugal or from the CVRs? Is there a huge concern in Portugal? Is there one region that is noticing climate change more than others? Sound. Well, yes, it's definitely, a, I think, a subject in the agenda also for, for themselves because they are worried about the environment and I think they want to do better, but also uh, because of, of requests from certain countries. And, and we realize uh, here at Wines of Portugal, uh, when dealing with markets that the Nordic countries, for example, or Canada, uh, even the US, um, they are starting to request um, certification for sustainability um, programs, um, so they are they have concerns about that. Um, we don't have perfect statistics about our organic uh, wines, but I do realize because you know Eugenie, we are always getting requests by journalists and everybody about how's the sustainability in the country. And when we do this kind of research with the producers, we realize almost everybody is doing some kind of sustainability process, even if it's just integrated production, keeping the biodiversity, um, some definitely going into certification that might be for the future more. It's been growing uh, in the country. I don't have numbers exactly. That's always a, a hard thing, but um, it's definitely been growing. When it comes to regions, as you can imagine, and, and Louise, Serdaira just said they, they are doing it all in, in an organic way, but um, I would imagine always that the humid, the regions with more humidity are always more difficult for doing the, the organic certification as they are more prone to diseases and it's difficult not to use treatments, but I think they, they can make it depending on the area where they are. Um, and of course, we know there's more presence of, um, of organic, in this case, I'm speaking organic certification in the areas of uh, inland Portugal. So more uh, Douro, Beira Interior, uh, some Alentejo, that's where you find most of the of the certified producers uh, okay. there's regions of course with worries you we know Alentejo is doing their own um, and I think we are probably going forward with some kind of national certification eventually for thank sustainability you. thank you Philippa uh, Philippa Sofia I always yeah. switch yeah. their names Thank you, Sophia. Um, uh, one last touch that I'm gonna do before we wrap it up is that someone had asked a fantastic question that I cannot pass. How can we support your wines at the retail level to the casual shopper entering the store? Here's what I say to you. If you walk into a store and you don't see any Portuguese wines, you ask for who buys the wine for your store and you tell that person, why don't you have any Portuguese wines? Or can you have some Portuguese wines? Or can you put on your mailing list or in your newsletter when you get Portuguese wines? Because a lot of questions that I get asked 
and I know we need to wrap up, but I need to touch the subject, is that the, the problem is not the consumer. The consumer actually wants to be exposed to the wines. The problem is the importer trusting that the consumers will want the wine. The importer convincing the distributor that the consumer wants the wine. The distributor convincing the retailer and the restaurateur that you want the wines. So it's pressure, move it upward, ask for it, and Portugal will thank you. Portugal will welcome you uh, to come and visit. It is a beautiful country with wonderful people. Thank you to all our presenters. And Christian, I'm sending it back to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, on behalf of Napa Valley Wine Academy and the wines of Portugal. Eugenio, always a pleasure to have you present with such passion uh, and dedication for the wines of Portugal. And of course, thank you to all the winemakers uh, for sharing your time uh, and your wonderful fruits of your efforts. Uh, hopefully, we've inspired you today to go out and buy more, enjoy more, and talk more about uh, Portuguese wines. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe and uh, enjoy the rest of the wines. And we hopefully will welcome you back to another Wines of Portugal webinar uh, very soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.